Well, welcome to Family Bible Time. We are in Nahum chapter 3 and we are in Luke chapter 18. And I'm in Texas. I'm in uh, Dallas, uh, staying with a friend here and attending a conference. And I'm in the twilight zone. So let me get started and get this underway. Hello, my lovely girls. I uh, miss you so much. Looking forward to seeing you again this week. I'll be back soon, I hope, but another few days to go. So let's pray. Let's get into the text. Father in heaven, we pray for your, your blessing upon our time. We pray that you would please teach us now. Please lead us in the truth. Please forgive us our sins. Thank you for your help um, today. Thank you for your blessing upon uh, us in uh, different sides of the Atlantic, blessing us in church and giving us ministry for our souls. Please, Lord, would you minister to our souls again now as we read the Bible as a family, even though we're separated in, in by a great distance and even watching this on, uh, on a different day to me recording it. Lord, I pray that you would still bless each and every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Nahum chapter 3. This is the last chapter in Nahum. I really feel like I've done a bad job. I'm sorry, I've been so tired trying to record this for you um, that I didn't really point out too much of what's going on here. And one thing I think that would be helpful for you to see is just the, the reality. If you look at chapter... 1 and verse 12, um, it, in verse 12, it says, Thus says the Lord, though they are at full strength and many, they will be cut down and passed away. Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. That's chapter 1, verse 12. If you look at chapter 3 and verse 19, um there is no easing of your heart. Your wound is grievous. All who hear the news about you clap their hands over you. For upon whom has not come your unceasing evil? And that kind of represents a bit of a um, bracket for this, this chapter. Uh, this this book and there's this um, reality that the the Lord is highlighting the fact that Nineveh, with all its wickedness, with all its strength, with all its um, its its dominance on the world scene in that day. So Nineveh was the dominating empire the the assyrian empire um they are going to be totally destroyed and what you get in between that is uh, really the unpacking of that idea um chapter three now is spelling out the woes to nineveh so here we go woe to the bloody city all full of lies and plunder, no end to the prey. They crack the whip, the crack of the whip and the rumble of the wheel, galloping horse and bounding chariot, horsemen charging, flashing sword and glittering spear, hosts of slain, heaps of courses, dead bodies without end. They stumble over the bodies and all for the countless whorings of the prostitute. Wow, graceful and of deadly charms, who betrays nations with her whorings and peoples with her charms. He's talking about the city of Nineveh and the people of the Assyrians. Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts, and, I, and will lift up your skirts over your face. This is God saying he's going to humiliate the Ninevites. And I will make nations look at your nakedness and kingdoms at your shame. I will throw filth at you and treat you with contempt and make you a spectacle. And all 
who look at you will say, will shrink from you and say, wasted is Nineveh. Who will grieve for her? Where shall I seek comforters for you? Are you better than Thebes that sat by the Nile with water around her, her rampart, a sea and water her wall? Cush was her strength, Egypt too, and that without limit. Put and the Libyans were her helpers. Yet she became an exile. She went into captivity. Her infants were dashed in pieces at the head of every street. For her honoured men, lots were cast. And all her great men were bound in chains. You also will be drunken. You will go into hiding. You will seek a refuge from the enemy. All your fortresses are like fig trees with first ripe figs. If shaken, they fall into the mouth of the eater. Behold, your troops are women in your midst. The gates of your land are wide open to your enemies. And fire has devoured your bars. Now, just a little historical note. If you look at verse Eight, are you better than Thebes? And Thebes fell, verse 10, yet she became an exile. And that actually helps us date Nahum, if you're trying to work out when Nahum was writing. Um, this dates it after 663 BC when Thebes fell to Ashurbanipal. Um, Thebes was then rebuilt 10 years later. And, and the lack of any mention of that probably dates this between uh, 663 and 653 BC. Um, if you look down at verse 11, a little interesting note, it says you also will be drunken and you will go into hiding. And in the King James Version, it, it seems to pick out what is probably a passive, um, the NASB, New King James uh, Authorised Version translates it as a passive, not um, you shall go into hiding, but you shall be hidden, which is what happened, interestingly, to Nineveh. It was literally buried in the sand and, until it was discovered in 1842 AD. There we are. Um, verse 14. Draw water for the siege. Strengthen your forts. Go into the clay. Tread the mortar. Take hold of the brick mould. There will the fire devour you. The sword will cut you off. It will devour you like the locust. Multiply yourselves like the locust. Multiply like the grasshopper. You increase your merchants more than the stars of the heavens. The locust spreads its wings and flies away. Your princes are like grasshoppers. Your scribes like clouds of locust, settling on the fences in the, in the day of cold. When the sun rises, they fly away. No one knows where they are. Your shepherds are asleep, O king of Assyria. Your nobles slumber, your people are scattered on the mountains with none to gather them. There is no easing your heart, your wound is grievous. All who hear the news about you clap their hands over you, for upon whom has not come your unceasing evil. Yeah, that's where Nahum ends. Now, back up a little bit. Once again, what's all this about? What, what, what is Nahum getting at? Okay, Nahum is prophesying um, about the downfall, the judgment upon Nineveh. Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. The Assyrians, the foes of Israel, the persecutors of Israel. Okay, 722 BC, they carried Israel off into, into exile, into captivity. But now this is 100 um, plus, not quite 100 years later, 
um, 663 to 653 Nahum's prophesying, but not till um, 612 BC would Nineveh fall. But the so it, it was over a hundred years later that the that the Ninevites actually experienced this judgment hundred over a hundred years after Jonah went there and they were revived and restored. But now this is predicting the judgment of God upon Nineveh. Now, uh, what do we get from this? We so said, what? This is a little bit like Revelation chapter 18 with the, the judgment of God upon Babylon. And it's very helpful to realize that God is taking note of the oppressive world power that oppresses the people of God. And God is not ignoring that. God is actually going to bring those very people to judgment. He's not going to fail to do that. And so we can take comfort to some degree in the knowledge that the, 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 the wicked, cruel, oppressive Assyrians are going to meet their judge one day. And he's not going to forget. Yes, Jonah, when they repent, he relents. But God is not unjust. And when they are cruel and oppressive and they don't repent, God is able and actually willing to pour out judgment upon them. And he did. And that's the message of Nahum in brief. Okay. Uh, Luke chapter 18, whilst you're turning there, it's helpful to realize God is not going to fail to judge this generation. God is not going to fail to judge the wicked, cruel oppressors of our own day. We don't have to fret about that. We just have to get on with trusting God in the meantime. All right, Luke chapter 18. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused. But afterward, he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. And that's really comforting, isn't it? Nevertheless, when the, faith, the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, you've got to get this parable right. I mean, this is really revolutionary, isn't it? So here's a Pharisee and here's a tax collector. The one is very religious and the other one is very 
irreligious, unreligious, very immoral, stealing, cheating for a living. And they both want to go up to the temple to pray. So which one's going to be acceptable to God? The really religious guy who's trying to keep all God's rules or the sinner? Which one's going to be acceptable to God? Well, actually, the really religious person goes, tries to go to God and says, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. And he's comparing himself to other people and he thinks he's doing pretty well. I do this. I do that. It's all about him. It's all about his performance. And the sinner, the tax collector, goes to God and just prays, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says, no, it's not the religious person. It's the sinner who asks for forgiveness. He goes home forgiven. He goes home justified before God. He goes home declared to be righteous. He's about how could God declare a sinner to be righteous? Well, that's the wonder of the gospel. God declares the guilty to be right, righteous, not because they are in themselves, because, but because God is willing to pay for their sins, to wipe the slate clean and to declare them to be, in his sight, guiltless. That's really good news, isn't it? That's what the Bible calls justification. And, and the Bible says that's as a gift not earned, not received by what we do, but received by faith. Now they were bringing even infants to him, verse 15, that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him, saying, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And a, a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honour your father and mother. And he said, All these I have kept since my youth up. From when Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad. For he was extremely rich. Jesus, looking at him with sadness, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for the, a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, Then who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Praise God. And Peter said, see, we've left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. And taking the twelve, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. Now, stop stop there for a second. Jesus is saying it's all going to be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise. But they understood none of these things. The saying was hidden from them, because, and they did not grasp what, he, what was said. As he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging, hearing a crowd going 
by, he inquired what this meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by, and he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. When he came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. I'm going to have to stop there because my eyes are closing and I can't stay awake and focus so i'm going to say good night god bless you and i'll see you tomorrow